Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. If you have benefited from listening to the show, if you've been blessed by it, then please consider supporting it through Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw, patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw. And you can support the show for as little as five bucks a month. You get access to premium content and um, join the Theology in the Raw community. We've got some great uh, discussions and uh, things that happen on that platform. So consider coming on over and joining the crowd. I have on the show today my friend and somebody who I've learned a lot from over the years, Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor. Uh, Dr. Pryor, or as I like to call her, Karen, is Research Professor of English and Christianity and Culture at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. She formerly taught at Liberty University. She's the author of several books, including the most recent, uh, her most recent book, On Reading Well, Finding the Good Life Through Great Books, put out by Brazos Press. And she's also the co-editor of Cultural Engagement, a crash course in contemporary issues. What I love about Karen, what I love about Karen is that she is... Um, unwaveringly committed to um, uh, the scriptures. She's a solid Bible-believing Christian, and yet she is also full of wisdom, wit, and sass. (laughs) And if you follow Karen on Twitter, um, I don't follow her on other social media accounts, but uh, I've seen her on Twitter, and I love how she is provocative She's creative. She uh, keeps you on your toes. So I'm super excited to have Karen back to talk about, mm, what's the title of this? We we wanted to talk about something like being a Christian in post-Trump America. That that could take us in many different directions. Um, So I think you're going to really enjoy this interesting, engaging conversation. Please welcome back to the show for the second time, the one and only Dr. Karen swallow Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. Um, I'm here with my friend, uh, Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor. You've already heard of her credentials. Uh, we share a love of books. And if you're watching the YouTube version of this podcast, you can see all kinds of love uh, behind us. So I just, uh, you know, Karen, I, I, I didn't read a book until I was 19 years old. I hated to read. And now I can literally sit here in my basement and just read all day. Are you are you kind of like that? I mean, obviously you're a, a, a booky person, but is that I mean, is, does your glo- is a glo- does a glorious Saturday look like you and a stack of books <laughs> and a cup of coffee or? <laughs> well, actually, you know, it's almost like the reverse because I grew up loving books. I had my, my nose in a book all the time. That's all I did was read, and then I became an English professor and continued to read, and then like Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> And everything changed. No, <laughs> but um, no, but also, also, it's not just you know digital media, but even just as a writer, uh, I find I find myself, you know, I, I have to write a lot, and I'm a slow writer, okay. and it takes a lot of time. And so, a lot of times, even when, as I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh, I wish I could be reading right now. So hmm. I actually spent feel like I spend less time reading than I did as a young person because I didn't have anything else. To, that's all I did. Yeah. So, so I got now, a couple... I'm, now I'm grown up and I have other responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a couple of questions on reading actually, before we jump into some other conversations about politics and culture and so on. Um, okay. So I am really bad at reading fiction. Um, and yet most wise people in my life say, look, I know you're a public intellectual. I know you need to read nonfiction. I know that's probably what you do. You need to read fiction. It will help you think better, read better, write better. It, your, it helps with your imagination, your creativity. Um, would you agree with that? I'm going to assume you're going to agree with that, but I just want to get confirmation from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Should I be reading fiction regularly? Is that something that you would say is really important for me to do? Yes, but I want to expand if I may. Okay, you may. May I expand? You may. <laughs> yes. So fiction is a pretty broad category that includes – Jane Austen and uh, you, you, like, uh, I, you know, I don't know, Harlequin romances or something. So <laughs> okay. so when you talk about fiction, like I want you to read literary fiction, which means, you know, Jane Austen, Toni Morrison, Charles Dickens, okay. you know, people who write, who use words as an art form to tell a story. There's nothing wrong with, you know, reading a, a mystery novel or, you know, the latest, you know, uh, pulp fiction or something. Yeah. But 
if you're that, that's just entertainment and that's fine. That's like a little bit like watching television, um, even though it's still reading. Okay. But when you read literary fiction, it's really for formation, not information. Um, and so you read it in a different way, even than you would when you would read you know, philosophy or theology, because it's basically like looking at a painting. You know, you go to a museum and you look at the painting, not just to, because you want to see what a bowl of fruit looks like. Yeah. <laughs> you go because you want to see how the artist used paint to recreate some experience. And so literary writers are using words to recreate an experience. You just you you can certainly you want to get caught up in the story, certainly, but it's also a matter of paying attention to how the words create that narrative experience. And so that means slowing down and, um, you know, not just getting the information, but just really observing the story in the same way that you would observe, you know, a painting. Okay. I've been reading. And that, um... cha and that changes you. It doesn't just inform you. It's not like you're just reading to find right. out, oh, what was London like in 1852? Right. Um, it's more like experiencing it huh. through the medium of language. I've been into uh, kind of some of the famous dystopian um, novels like 1984, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, just read. Okay, those are great. Lord of the Good. Flies and stuff. Good. Yeah, <laughs> because you know, it's I love. Oh, no, I love that. I love that stuff. And, and they're, they're, they are great stories. Yeah. Um, but they also do more than just entertain us. Right. And, and what those are, I right. feel like those are slightly different because there is so much societal, moral connection with themes going on today, mm -hmm. you know? So it's almost sure. like it, I, I, 1984 in particular is almost on the fence between fiction and nonfiction. You know, I mean, there's so many things I'm like, wow, well that just happened last week on social media. And like, how did you <laughs> predict that 70 years ago? But, um, now, now, very true. When I'm reading, so I'm reading uh, right now. I'm, and I d please don't def defriend me, but I mean, I've I've literally never read To Kill a Mockingbird or, or Catcher in the Rye. So I I'm in the middle of To Kill a Mockingbird right now. I ordered Catcher in the Rye. Some just some stuff that I just missed out on in life. Um, when I'm reading literary fiction, like you said, it's forming you. Do I need to be actively paying attention to the forming, or if I just get absorbed in the book, is it kind of a passive? I'm absorbing language and imagination and moral dilemmas like does that make sense like do i need or do i need to be taking notes yeah, and yeah. highlighting I mean, no, phrases i mean just and... being absorbed is wonderful um and you that that's really all all that it is it, that's required to have that formative experience um but i guess it's often often literary fiction can pose a difficulty you know just because it's either you know it's not straightforward or yeah. it uses language in a different way or has you know uses different narrators so when you encounter those things that kind of make you give you pause um, those are things to engage with, okay. um, accept it as a good challenge that exercises kind of your empathetic and uh, perspective, perspective muscle um, yeah. and, you know, and accept that and ask, ask questions about it. But if you're completely absorbed, then it's going to do the work that it's supposed okay. to do, um, yeah. which is primarily to um, tell a good story. Um, yeah. But it still does it in a way that's... Um, just different from yeah. you know just cheap you know yeah. supermarket fiction yeah vampire romance <laughs> yeah um, i don't think they sell those books in the supermarket anymore i don't even think we use the word supermarket anymore um but <laughs> but i'm but i'm old so yeah. here we go <laughs> so I, I need you to catch me let's transition now to just a, a broader cultural conversation I, I want to have you on because i feel like you're one of the best people i know who is solidly evangelical you, you know you're you, you teach at an sbc school um and yet i shouldn't say and yet and also um you, you're uh, um a very self-critical like like you're a um a critical thinker like like you don't just accept things you're not afraid to push back challenge you're not afraid to stir the pot karen in case people didn't know that about you which is why i really i really appreciate you but um I've actually been gone for the last few months. I don't know when this podcast is going to release, but I was on an extended study break. I didn't check the news. I didn't, I still am, well, I, I actually have an assistant who does some of my social media, so it might look like I'm more active than I am. Um, but it's amazing when you kind of unplug for a little bit, how, how, first of all, delightful it is. And second of all, how much you're like, 
life isn't as bad as I thought it was, or I don't know, like it doesn't seem like the whole world's caving in, but maybe it is. I don't know. But can can you give me a, I would love to hear your global thoughts on 2020. Is that too big of a question? <laughs> I mean, as we read 50 years from now and people are reading about 2020, what are they going to, what are those history books going to say? And how have you gotten through this year as an evangelical Christian who's very socially, culturally in tune? <laughs> mm. That is a big question, but I, um, yeah, I, I, I want to answer it. I'll try to get paint a big picture and then maybe that will, you know, that can, that connects to some of the specific, you know, very specific things about this time and place in our country anyway. So I just got fresh off a, a, of an interview with, um, this morning with Sven Burkertz, who is who wrote the Gutenberg Elegies and Changing the Subject, which are I, I just refer to Sven as the Neil Postman of our time. Oh, wow. And if you don't know who Neil Postman is, anyone who's listening, he wrote his most famously Amusing Ourselves to Death, mm -hmm. in which he talks about the sort of transition that we're going through um, from print culture to uh, electronic culture. I mean, he was writing, Postman was writing in like 1984, I think, or in 85. And so it was really even before the digital age, but he was writing about the age of television and, um, and celebrity as it was then, uh, wow. very prophetic. Um, and everything that he's, he predicted has, has come true. And so Sven writes about the more current digital age and, uh, as we were talking, we were talking about how Postman um, talked about a 500 year old print age, an age of print and all that that it, it does to us as citizens and people to be literate and to read um, and um, the kinds of presidential debates that defined early America because we were a literate culture and how debates were really more like long hours, long mm -hmm. speeches. Um, and now we are are in this digital age where everything's reduced to social media sound bites and image and celebrity and very ephemeral. And the point that, um, that Sven made it in our conversation earlier today is that 2020 just kind of crystallized this thing that's been going on for the past few decades as we've, as we've really transitioned from a print culture to a digital media culture. Um, now that's kind of a lot, but that I think that we are in many ways emerging into another kind of 500 year moment of human civilization. You know, so we yeah. had 1500 years of Christendom mm -hmm. uh, before the Reformation. The Reformation brought about a great number of changes, including uh, the printing press and and a literate age. And now we're entering a post literate age that's defined by digital media. And I think 2020 is kind of a hinge moment in this transition. It's like the 1517. Um, and that has lots of implications. The year the what? Guten, what was it 1450 when the Gutenberg? It's it's one of those. It's going to go down as kind of that that yeah that turning point yes. I mean, that's uh, phyllis yes. tickle talked about that didn't she and um oh what's that the great do you know are you familiar with this she had that kind of every 500 years there's uh... i actually just got that book oh yes. yeah it's really good i haven't yeah. read it yet but but someone else um recommended that to me when when i was talking in this way they told me i needed to read that book and i just got it I, i've used the 500 years like the fall of constantine or no the conversion of constantine the East West divide in 1054, mm. which, which might, that might not have, well, maybe it had a greater impact than I realized. And then of course, reformation and now the internet. Uh, but yeah, she, she wrote about that. I think it was like an eight years ago or something. So even mm. then it's, it was a bit prophetic. Right. But, um, right. um, do, do you, so when you say this is kind of a transitionary year, a kind of, do you, this soundbite driven culture, are you seeing it coming to a climax in, People are going to start to go beyond that to back to more long form um, conversations. Are you saying this is now kind of the beginning of even more? Yes, that's bites? what I'm saying. I'm oh, sorry. no, really? I'm sorry. Ah, dang it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, because to go to go back to the more specific example that you were talking about the election, like there's really nothing at all surprising about not the election itself. Well, yeah, the, the entire election, but I mean, 
leading up to it Mm -hmm. and what we're in now this sort of this this debate over what the truth is (laughs) and what reality is in terms of something as theoretically quantifiable concrete and tangible as counting ballots right i mean my i mean how more how more measurable and factual can you get than that yeah and yet our country believes you know a good you know a is divided over the reality, some, a very physical, tangible, concrete reality. And um, that questioning of basic reality has come about because of, you know, this soundbite age mm-hmm. and this disconnectedness of all information, pieces of information from other infor- pieces of information. We have so much information, we don't know how mm-hmm. to knit it together into a form of knowledge, let alone wisdom. What, what about, so let alone knowing what the truth is. You're, you're, you're probably right because you are who you are. Um, I was hoping, though, <laughs> that it seems that podcast, long form podcasts are really taking off. Like you think, you know, like classic example, like Joe Rogan, probably the most popular podcaster. You know, he's got three to four hour conversations, right? And, and, you know, he'll have six, seven, eight million downloads per episode when CNN can interview Biden or Trump and get a million views, you know, and Rogan talking about sometimes nothing for three hours, but just having a, a long form conversation. I mean, some, some, oftentimes they're very stimulating conversations and there's many, I mean, other podcasts are, seem to be really taking off. I just, I, I was hoping that that might be a sign that a growing number of people are looking for more long form discussions rather than the sound bites, rather than the 30 second clip to, you know, stir the pot on some mainstream media outlet. Is that, is there anything to that? Do you think, or? Well, let me, let me confess that this is something with which I'm entirely unfamiliar. Mm. I did not even know that such a thing existed as a three hour podcast. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) <laughs> i'm not sure i needed to know that no um <laughs> and here we are on a podcast i actually don't even listen to podcasts but let me so let me think out loud for a minute about that yeah um i do find the 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 length of the conversation is certainly kind of you know is is good that's better than a sound bite but i was actually literally thinking about this the other day because people send me podcasts all the time and they tell me i should listen to this and listen <laughs> to that and i don't and i don't and i when yeah. i'm running if I'm not listening um, to music, um, I'm listening to books on Audible, and I realize that I, the re- that I don't like podcasts. <laughs> Present company excluded, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> including myself, because it, it and it, it, no, it's they are they they they're wonderful. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> their limitation is that it's people. It, they are we are thinking out loud. We're yeah. sort of drafting, um, which is fine, but we aren't polishing and constructing, right. you know, we're, we aren't comp- like a book, a book is polished and constructed and, and, and revised and yeah. edited. Um, and so a podcast is more like a work in progress, which is, which is fine in itself. Right. Um, but like you said, you said the podcast was three hours about nothing. So, well, yeah, I mean, so I, know let, let me... I know you didn't mean that literally, but yeah. Um, but I think we're there's also sort of a freestyle, yeah. even if it's long, that yeah. is similar to a three hour podcast and to a tweet. Let, let me back up. So, yeah, uh, sometimes, again, going back to the Joe Rogan example, and I only, you know, I don't know if you know, he got um, Spotify signed him for one hundred million dollars to be exclusive on Spotify rather than iTunes, you know, because they saw this his I mean. It's super popular. Wow. Super inf- yeah, it's crazy. That's like be- that's like being a football player. Or oh, something, right? yeah. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so, so yeah. S- sometimes he'll have his some friends on the show, and sometimes they end up just bantering around. I would say the majority of the time, or at least half the time, he will have an expert, an intellectual, oftentimes like a scientist. He'll have a lot of controversial people on, um, and so he does bring on like an expert who is bringing loads of expertise and he asks hard questions he'll push back you know he's a very smart guy as, as well so 
Um, and I, it's, it's fascinating that he can have on some academic from Oxford University talking about neuroscience for three hours and it'll get, you know, hmm. six million downloads. But I, I, that still is still a different direction than reading a book from cover to cover. So I, I yeah, I, I, maybe we just don't know exactly what I, I just I, th- I do think it's scratching an itch specifically mm-hmm. for people, even though they have fallen into the addiction in many cases of the soundbite, Twitter culture, whatever. I think there still is this hunger for deeper, more meaningful, longer conversations. Um, he had he had mm-hmm. Bernie Sanders on hour long episode. This was a short one. <laughs> and it was really <laughs> Uh, it was fascinating. I've never listened to Bernie Sanders for more than five minutes because most outlets, it's just a little fight. It's just a sound bite, you know, but right, they hear him. Right, and right. I'm not a Bernie Sanders fan. I mean, I, there's some things he says that I might resonate with. But I mean, I um, it was really interesting. I was like, wow, this is an actual human being because I can hear them talk mm-hmm. and think and get pushed back on and push back and explain, you know, and um, it was it was refreshing, even though much of what he said, I was like, oh, I'm not sure I'm on, on board with that. But um I don't know. No, um, I, I I agree with that. That is, it is a positive sign, given you know the other um, impulses pu- pushing against that kind of thing. It just there is sort of an ephemeral nature mm-hmm. of it, even if it's long. Yeah. Um. And so that's yeah. you know I think that's you know that's I mean this again to go back to Neil Postman, who, who is just a, a huge influence on my my thinking and has been for thirty years. Um. It's just you know there's a there's and, and it's, there are pros and cons. So uh, it's not that a matter of, of I, I mean, I have my bias. I, I, I'm fond of print culture. Um, but there's a the kind of a permanence and a commitment mm-hmm. and an authority that comes with putting something in print, mm-hmm. theoretically. Um, you know, now, you know, any anybody, anybody with a blue check on Twitter, I guess, can publish a book or plagiarize a book um, <laughs> and sell a lot of copies. <laughs> but that's part of, I guess that's part of the end of a real print culture as well. The blue check on Twitter. So how do you even, <laughs> how does that, I don't even know how that works. I have a blue check so I can. I oh, can you do? Okay. Do you have to sign up for it? Or do they give it to you or are they, I don't even. It's know. a very mysterious process and it's become more mysterious. Like people, I, I, I actually don't remember how I got, like there's, and I think that since I got it, they've suspended the process. I, I really don't okay. know because people have asked me and I've, I've try, even looked it up and and it's just very weird. Um, <laughs> but yes, it, it was something I filled something out yeah. for. But I think you can't even access that thing anymore. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't know. What it's, do you think about the conversation surrounding censure, cen, censure, censorship? <laughs> censure. Can you prove <laughs> Censorship, yes. Censorship. <laughs> censorship. Why can I say Darky? censorship? <laughs> and um, social media, some of the stuff regarding Twitter and to, I think, a lesser extent, Facebook. But um, what can you summarize for an alien that just landed on planet Earth? Like, what's going on in that conversation? And do you have any thoughts on um, what's yeah, going on there? Yeah, I mean, um, you mentioned uh, 1984, so I'll probably invoke that as well. <laughs> I mean, so so there, the true censorship really in, in its – true definition can only be done by the government um that you know censorship is a government action traditionally in in law um but we use the term to talk about you know we we use it in a different way there's that second meaning where like i I could censor you right now by hanging up or something you know i can or i can censor my own thoughts by repressing them um and so facebook and twitter you know they're private companies and they um you know we 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 think that they aren't (laughs) um we forget that they are and uh they're trying to be responsible by stemming the flow of of dangerous and false information and i understand that 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 actually can backfire because even though they have the right to do that um it actually can feed into uh paranoia that already exists Mm -hmm. and end up you know pushing these conspiracy theories further away so i don't know that it's a, a a good idea uh, but I don't know that even, you know, I, I, I'm, I have some ethical questions that are constantly arising about Twitter and Facebook anyway, simply because of the fact that they have to employ 
lots and lots and lots of people to review vile content as part of their jobs um, in order to prevent those things from being disseminated. I'm talking about things like child pornography um, that Mm -hmm. people try to post um, and gets taken down. And so, so there are huge, huge ethical concerns that private companies and we as individuals have to deal with just because we are in this, what I like to call this new dark age Hmm. of just rampant information and media. I I do have a, yeah, I guess I do. I am concerned with it because like you said, who's to determine what is dangerous and bad ideas, you know, especially in this day and age, like, and my, my only real experience with it, cause I'm, I'm way too small for anybody to care, but like even on, on, uh, I started a YouTube channel. This will be on YouTube and all <laughs> sometimes I'll get a video that's demonetized or, or dimmed down. And it's always something that I mean, some of it's like, like I just had an interview with a, a girl who identified as trans in her teenage years, took testosterone, transitioned partially, and then ended up detransitioning back to female. And it's, it's very critical of how she was, she would even say verbally abused and brainwashed by certain ideologies and stuff. And that, that was demonetized. She's just telling her story. Mm-hmm. So then they would say that's dangerous. Like actually some there was a, a Reddit thread called D trans, which just told stories of people who have detransitioned, and that's, mm-hmm. that's deemed to be dangerous. And even mm-hmm. people who do detransition, mm-hmm. they say, no, people mm-hmm. see me as if mm-hmm. I don't maintain a trans identity, I'm viewed as toxic, dangerous, mm-hmm. right wing, mm-hmm. Hitler, Nazi, bigot, mm-hmm. all these things. And it's like, mm-hmm. whoa, 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 who? <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Really? Like, or even anything that reflects any kind of Christian view of sexuality, mm-hmm. all those videos, almost all of them are, are demonetized um, mm-hmm. on my, YouTube. So somebody, and I could see, cause I'll, I'll always request a, a, it's an automatic review computerized that demonetizes it. Then they say you can, you can request confirmation and I could see there's always two views. So two people or one person's viewing it twice. Mm-hmm. So there is a real person on the other side. Um, I don't know their worldview. I don't know their moral framework. They may mm-hmm. see Christianity is dangerous mm-hmm. for society. So I just, yeah, so I don't know. This is a this is a tough thing mm-hmm. for me. Yes, I would agree. I hope everyone would agree that social media platforms should not host child pornography. Should they host stories of somebody who used to identify as trans and doesn't do so mm-hmm. anymore? Should they mm-hmm. host somebody advocating? Here we mm-hmm. go, of say reparative therapy. Both you and I would not mm-hmm. agree with that, but because we don't agree with it, does that mean? that needs to be censure, censured, censured, <laughs> censored <laughs> off the internet. Like I, I, I think I have a problem with that. Like, I think that does go back to, uh, will that lead to a 1984 mm-hmm. scenario where, which is disastrous really. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not a, yeah, I don't know. No, no. I mean, the, I, 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 these are, these are real concerns. Um, and this is why I've always been extremely, um, uh, extreme, I guess, in my First Amendment and free speech views, um, and again, informed by the 17th century Puritan John Milton, who wrote one of the first um, treatises from, a, and, and also that treatise was from a very conservative Christian point of view, arguing for in our terms today would be freedom, free, the free press. It, that's not the term that was used, yeah. but um, because be, because even if these private companies have the right to do this, it it, it actually again, it, it I mean, unless, yeah. we need to encounter what we believe to be wrong ideas with with good ideas. Right. Um, and it's it's dangerous not to do that to push them underground. Um, and so the the, the companies really should follow the first. Yeah, you know, they should follow constitutional law. Uh, which already deems child pornography and yelling fire in a crowded theater, you know, not covered by the First Amendment. Right. Um, and so these other things are still as still so far. Um, yeah. Co- you know, not not against the law. But, yeah, we are we are entering a different time as as Christians. We are entering a post Christian culture. And yeah. that leaves a lot of questions for us to ask. And I and I've, I have talked to Christians who. Um, are are really scared. I mean, they 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 might be deemed conspiracy theorists, and and I, that 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 term though. I mean, it's, 
it, it's kind of a negative term. Like you present an idea like, hey, I think there's a guy that has an island where there's like underage kids having sex with well-known people. It's like, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. And then Jeff Epstein gets a lot, you know, arrested and <laughs> dies in prison mm-hmm. or whatever. It's like, mm-hmm. um, I, w- w- what? <laughs> sometimes there are actual things happening and all, if you just b- brand them a conspiracy theory, then all of a sudden you're seen as a wacko, you mm-hmm. know, but, um, I don't know. I, I, mm, I, I guess I would definitely lean towards let people engage the idea as far out as it may seem to some people, um, mm-hmm. Jesus rising from the dead and reigning at the right hand of some invisible creator. God is a, absurd idea to many people um that that could be you know a conspiracy theory so i I guess i'm more of a fan of letting people sort it out for themselves um to engage the idea and if it really is a hack job ridiculous conspiracy theory then present better evidence to the contrary and show why the evidence used to support that theory is actually wrong you know um i think the flat earth society should absolutely be allowed to promote their ideas on <laughs> Facebook and social. <laughs> if they really are that far out, then it shouldn't take more than five minutes to refute them. But some people say, well, you're platforming dangerous ideas. And I just, I don't, mm, I, I just don't even know if I agree with th- that as a mm-hmm. concern. If it really is that bad of an idea that everybody should be able to recognize it as a bad idea, then it then platform it. Let David Duke spout off his ignorance and, 99.99% of humanity is going to say, what an idiot, you know, like, I don't, I don't even think we should censure well, him. Should yeah. we? Or? No, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, but I think what, I think the real problem is that we are in a place where 99.9% of, of people are not going to do that. So, but that, so that's where our real work <laughs> is. It's not in, in, I mean, we should let all of these ideas air. Um, but we still have a lot of we have work to do in helping people distinguish you know to to know how to weigh good sources from from bad and to mm. you know i mean so so but that's a that's a different question right because 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 ninety nine point nine percent of people do not think that David Duke's ideas are crazy well that's there, the problem. really <laughs> well maybe you're in virginia so maybe I, i'm out here in well i'm in idaho i but. mean you know i i not to get too political but you know uh we you know i mean i don't i don't think uh trump won the election just on abortion yeah yeah um, should we go to should know, we talk he, about he, trump he, attract, gotta... he, he attracted a lot of voters for that reason and yeah. i understand that but um the white supremacists who support him didn't support him because of abortion yeah are there really yeah. a lot? And I hear again, it depends on who you ask. Like, how many actual right? I mean, according to like Robin D'Angelo, you and I are white supremacists because we're participating in you know a white dominant culture and in, in you know benefiting from the privileges, and that means we're part of white supremacy. But I mean, like the old school definition of white supremacy, the people who are you know either wearing hoods or believe that people of color are not fully human or whatever. Do you really, is that, is that a, I mean, I could be totally naive. Like, I just see that as such a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the population. that's not really carrying much influence at all, but maybe I'm totally wrong. And I'm sure I have listeners of color who are like, maybe screaming at me right now. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. What do you think? Yeah. I I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on the definition. I, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, how many how many people out there are sexist? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> can we count them? I don't. I doubt it. I mean, we all. You know, it's it's not it's not a binary black white yeah. category. You either have this view or you don't have this view. We're you know we're in we are creatures of culture. We are influenced by our cultures and by our institutions. Our institutions are are influenced by you know they are our institutions are are exist from the past they don't exist from the future um and so we inherit uh, this is what it means to be a human being is to be you know to be part of a culture and to be influenced by culture and relationships and by history um and if if you know to deny that we are influenced by the past is to deny that we are you know 
human beings born into yeah. time and uh, and existing in time. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, back to the maybe the race or even sexist thing. I think we have to make a big difference distinction between kind of overt, blatant, explicit acts of misogyny and racism versus unintentional you know um sure implicit bias or however you want to say it like there's i'm sure i'm guilty of this i'm sure i am of doing things or saying things that do come off as and are taken to be sexist even though there's no intention in my heart but it's just being well just what you're saying i mean being conditioned by a white male dominant culture has to have an effect on me on some level that i don't even see that it may take a journey to 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 weed out so um we could chase down that thread for a long time. You brought up Trump. I didn't. Um, but what, what, <laughs> what, um, so we're, we're recording this. I'll just say this is early December. I'm not sure. This is probably maybe released in early January. What does life in a post Trump, and maybe we need to unpack that, um, post Trump America look like for the evangelical Christian? Are you, celebrating the election um are you not sure who actually still won <laughs> so again this is early december <laughs> um or are you indifferent are you mourning w- where are you at on this what how do, when do you look forward to 2021 in a post trump or at least a post president trump era how are you feeling about that yeah, no, no, I, I don't think it really mattered. To me, it didn't matter who won. Um, I think it's a it's a loss for um, for America, a loss for the church, either way that we've gotten to this point. I mean, I am, you know, it's no secret, I am a never Trumper. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, um, you know, would never vote for Biden and, you know, mm-hmm. am not um, inclined, have never been inclined to vote for a Democrat. Um mm-hmm. But uh, what we're seeing, you know, so so but but it's, you know, sort of common wisdom that a big reason why we got Trump was kind of a reaction to the, you know, the previous administration's liberal, you know, liberal policies and liberal social agenda. And so what we see uh, is a, a pendulum swinging from, you know, one extreme to another. And I'm not sure when that the swinging of that pendulum will slow um, or whether, you know, in 2024, we will just see a pendulum swinging, you know, back Mm -hmm. again in whichever the opposite direction is. Uh, And that's that's the problem that faces us. Um, And, uh, you know, I I just don't see a way forward um, until you know, the Republican and Democratic parties kind of implode on themselves mm. and um, some sort of new uh, party or approach develops out of that. Um, Is, do you think that's yeah. possible? Do you think that's that's a, a possible outcome? Because they, they do seem to be at an all time hi i think i'm not i don't pay too close attention to politics or at least i haven't until the last couple of years but um it seems like things are more tense more divided more divisive more tribal than they ever have been maybe since the civil war i don't know i've heard people say that or since Mm -hmm. pre-civil rights era um do you see it as a possibility that they will kind of uh, implode on the inside and and some kind of other system rather than a dominant two-party system emerging is that a possibility well it, it's interesting i just read a column by um that i did share on on twitter so this is back you know whenever this is airing at some at some point in december a jonah goldberg column where he was talking about the time in the 1960s when if you said you were a democrat or a republican uh, either one the next question would be well are you a conservative or a liberal because those two uh. parties were not aligned with conservatism or liberalism at that time and conservatives saw an opportunity to advance the conservative agenda through the Republican Party. So at some point in the 60s, 70s, the Republican Party became aligned with conservatives. I'm a conservative. I'm not a Republican or Democrat. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't see the Republican Party as conservative anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also wasn't always. So so these kind you know, these I'm not a student of 
political science or history or even, you know, America. <laughs> um, my, my, I study British literature. Um, but, you know, we have not always had these two parties. These two parties' identities and platforms have not always been the same. They're, they have always uh, been changing over, over the course of, I would say, decades. Huh. Um, and since we're, you know, all people who are going to live for decades, not centuries, it's sometimes we don't realize how different these parties or the party system was at one time there were there were different parties and so i i think that these will change too and that's the opportunity that we have right now going yeah. forward is to change them or uh, yeah or, yeah yeah i think that'd be healthy again i i am not invested into the the party system, as I say many times, I'm an exile living in Babylon, and I find I find Babylonian politics actually pretty like entertaining. Like it's it's um, it's yeah, it can be fascinating, and 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 I can see how um, people can get swept up into it. It, it. You know, I think the media outlets do a great job of sucking you in and touching you in areas where you know mm -hmm. it gets you angry and your tribalistic juices start flowing and so on. But um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, and so I, I take this with a grain of salt, but it, it does seem from my vantage point as an outsider looking in, um, that the Democrat, the party, and maybe it's true of the Republicans, but the Democrat does seem to have a growing clear kind of division between the, for lack of better terms, the, the radical left and the classical liberals. Um, I see a lot of, um, tension there where you have the kind of a radical left that does feel a little more like eight, 1984, almost verbatim, almost mm -hmm. verbatim. There's like some things I'll read. And I'm like, you know, that's a quote from 1984, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're saying it positively mm -hmm. versus the kind of classical liberal. That's a big advocate of free speech that, you know, um, wants ideas to compete in, in, a, in an arena, um, but would definitely not be conservative. They would be pro gay marriage, pro abortion, pro, pro you know, pro choice and, and, so on and so forth um but they would they, but they seem to be dif disagreeing significantly from the sort of radical illiberal left as some people call it is that an accurate assessment assessment from what you know and is there is there something similar going on within the republican party where there's a growing mm -hmm. strong difference maybe it's between the anti-trumpers and the pro-trumpers i mean i could imagine mm -hmm. that you both might be republican some people not you but i could imagine that under that broad umbrella, there's some strong tensions there. I, I just listened to a debate between, uh, is it David French and who's the Bonhoeffer guy? Um, Eric Metaxas. Yeah. It was on yeah. a podcast. See, Karen, you got to, and, and you, you would not guess that these two are in the same political camp. Like they were right, uh, right. evenly opposed to each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, the old binary categories just don't, fit today. Um, and, uh, I think we're seeing kind of some growing pains out of that. And, um, yeah, and there are, there are, you know, j there's jockeying for power, um, from the various interests that are aligning themselves with, with both parties. Um, and so both parties are kind of, uh, you know, mm. subjected now t to those, those power plays on the parts of different groups. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know what the outcome will be, but I, I think we are going through a pretty dramatic shift right now. Do you what, what's your hope for the church in twenty twenty one in the quote unquote post Trump yeah, uh, era? I guess um, <laughs> my hope for the church is um, is is first of all to be the church in the way that the church is to be the church in all times and all places. Um, we tend, unfortunately, in the American church to think of ourselves up to, to tie, you know, this isn't news to anyone, but to tie being an American with being the church. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be the church first. We have to love God and love our neighbors. And we have to um, witness to the faith, hope and love that is, um, you know, is is the essence of our faith. Um but at the same time, you know, I, we, God, in God's sovereignty, he has placed each of us where we are. And if he has seen fit to have us 
live in America in 2020 and 2021, then there are um, responsibilities that we are to steward. And, uh, and so we can't just pretend that we're not Americans. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a separatist. Um, You know, so I'm not a, I'm not a patriot, you know, I'm not going to go to a patriot church or, or, but I'm also not a separatist. And I don't think that's what we're called to be. There's, I think we're called to be, um, you know, faithful Mm -hmm. in the places where God has put us. And so what it means to be a faithful Christian in America looks in many ways, just like what it means to be a faithful Christian in, you know, 18th century India um, mm-hmm. or 17th century Japan. But it also means, you know, what it looks like for to be a faithful Christian in 2020 America has with it, um, just as it does for anyone, some particular responsibilities. And um, and we need to uh, steward those faithfully mm-hmm. and well, too. We, yeah. So I seek the good of the city, you know, Jeremiah, um, you know, I referenced being in exile earlier, but that doesn't mean I should be indifferent to whatever society I'm living in, it's advancement and, um, and, and well, it's hmm, mm-hmm. seeking good in creation or, or, or establishing a just society. I mm-hmm. should never expect right. it to look right. Christian. Um, on my, the kingdom of the world will always be radically different than the kingdom of, um, of God. Um, and yet I do think we should address issues of justice mm-hmm outside the church walls when we see that. I guess my concern, because I have gotten, you know, my exile living in Babylon political stance. People do push back in two areas there. Number one, you know, well, it's, you have the privilege as a white male to say that. Other people don't have the privilege to just, you know, remove themselves from the political scene. Um, And the other one is kind of what I was saying, like the other critique would be, you know, that I'm not seeking the good of the city. I guess with both of those pushbacks though, I would still push back to the pushback saying no i agree with both of those things i just don't know if american 21st century partisan politics um is the best means to address Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. issues of justice and and i just i i don't see i see uh, i don't want to get myself into too much how how long does this lobster want to cook here um i i um I do question the accuracy through which we even know about the political scene. Um, and what I'm referencing is the our knowledge of what's going on in the political scene is mediated through extremely mm-hmm. narrative-based, biased media oh. outlets. Mm-hmm. And I don't think most people appreciate just how narratively driven they are and they've gotten Mm -hmm. way way worse because they're losing money they Mm -hmm. need clicks they need to get you angry they need to fire you up Mm -hmm. so i don't Mm -hmm. even um yeah i i don't (laughs) Pe- no, that's people really, that are staunchly I mean, that's really for or against this others. This is where the church needs to do more discipleship, right? And it's yeah. not, you know, we think of discipleship as as teaching the doctrines of the faith, and of course, that's that's that is discipleship is that, but it's more than that. It's also discipleship for our, you know, what it means to live in this culture in this time. And, and what you just said is so well put and so insightful that we just don't even realize how driven by these narratives that are not of our own making or our own even conscious awareness. Um, we just don't realize how much we are. And so part of discipleship is, is, is making our, ourselves aware of that um and because the, these are the times that we that we live in yeah right yeah yeah i mean if you if you actually did pay attention to the and i and i do i've this year i've dabbled in you know looking at news i i've got left wing moderate and right wing news outlets that i listen to and it's just it, again it's it is almost entertaining but extremely sad to see how narratively driven each each one is and then it's like well um we're not even really seeing politics for what it is. We're seeing a, a narrative mm-hmm. creation of mm-hmm. these scenes. You know, if I, if I, if I listen to a right wing outlet, you know, all they're going to do is show clips of Biden forgetting what state he's in and bumbling around mm-hmm. and saying the most radical thing. And um, if I listen to a right wing 
you know, critique, or sorry, if I listen to a left wing critique, then it's they'll handpick, you know, the most racist sounding thing Trump could have said and twist it in the worst mm-hmm. possible direction, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like th- these are truth. Whatever's going on out there is being the highly mediated mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. us more than ever, I think. I mean, I, I think more than ever, like maybe 20 years ago there was a bit more real journalism going on where people said, Hey, here's the facts. You sort out what you think that doesn't really exist anymore. And maybe to come full circle back the wh- where I do find it most helpful is going back to like two hour long conversations w- on a podcast or something mm-hmm. where I feel like it's just, you have a lot more space to kind of air out kind of this event, that event, what's really going on. You hear different mm-hmm. viewpoints and, and so on. But um, anyway, I mean, I, what I, you- what yeah. you've been describing is exactly the postmodernism that that you know evangelical Christians were warning the church about <laughs> you know twenty and thirty years ago, but they don't even recognize it now for what it is. It's basically right. that you know in the in the modern age we were driven by facts and there were fewer facts, yeah. so it was easier to kind of put the facts together and get a somewhat comprehensive understanding of the whole. Now we live in in an era where there are so many facts, so much information mm. that we can't possibly grasp, you know, any representative amount of it. And so the picture that I constantly have in my mind is that old parable of the of the blind men uh, standing, you know, around an elephant Mm. And each one has a part of the elephant, you know, the trunk, the tail, yeah. the the foot. And, and they're describing what the elephant is based on that little bit of information they have. Well, that is exactly where we are in this yeah. information age. There's so much swirling around that our descri- our understanding of, you know, we could have a correct understanding of the trunk or the tail. Right. Uh, but we do not have any idea what the elephant is. Um, mm. And so... But we, we, we don't even know that there is an elephant <laughs> for sometimes. Um, so we, we have these, we t- so we, but the facts are correct, right? Our little handful of facts right. is accurate, but it's, it's detached from the larger reality. And so that is the place that we are in right now. And even just recognizing that, um, you know, as, as human beings, but even more importantly, as Christians yeah. is, is crucial in this moment. Yeah. God. And, and so you're, you're not, it's going to keep getting worse. You're saying like the, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I mean, I, again, this is why I call it a new dark age, right? Mm. I, I mean, in the dark ages before, uh, the enlightenment and I, I that's a term that's going to, people don't use that term anymore because it's, you know, it's biased. Um, but I think it's helpful here. Mm. Um, you know, the people were subject to, um, superstitions and myths and folk tales mm-hmm. and to even worse to um to abuses by institutions mm-hmm. and um and powerful people uh and so we find ourselves i think at the other end of the modern age and um the age of literacy in kind of a similar mm-hmm. similar place um uh, there's just so much information we're also subject to such partial truths that they might as well be superstitions or myths or fairy tales. I I want to, we're just about out of time, Karen, you got to just a couple more minutes. Cause I I really wanted to ask. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I, um, I don't know if again, this is growing in number, if it's just always been this way, but it does seem like a, it feels like, again, I'm not saying this is a factual claim, but as a subjective feeling, it feels like, um, there's a growing number of Christian leaders that keep falling or, or just, I don't know. It's, it's it, your own former university. You had a very well known. This is, you know, Jerry Falwell had some interesting photo shots of his vacation on his yacht with black water in his hand, or whatever. And a, you know, a secretary. Um, and I don't even know what ended. I mean, I think he got fired. Is that a done deal or what was, or is that still going on? That, that might be so yeah, old no, news. No, that, no, that, 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 that is a, a done deal. It was a, a pretty, there were years of this kind okay. of abuse of power, um, which I think is, you know, really was, was the real problem and lack of accountability yeah. um, in the institution uh, because it takes a lot of, you know, time and money and uh, freedom to, uh, perpetuate these kinds of abuses for so long. I mean, anyone can fall, of course, and mm-hmm. and and you know that that's not the issue. The issue really is um, the kinds of things, structures in place that allow these things to go on unchecked for so long. 
Wow, there's a lot there. Um, what did that really hurt Liberty, or is Liberty doing fine, or what's the aftermath been? Um, I, at this point, it's uh, Liberty seems to be doing fine, and they have said that they're you know moving forward and mm-hmm. cleaning house. They've opened an investigation. Um, whether or not that really that the the real change that needs to take place, mm-hmm. only time will tell. Um, clearly, as I, as I implied in what I just said, it wasn't just a matter mm-hmm. of uh, one um, institutional leader doing these things. He doesn't do them in isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in any any institution, um, the people who are around a leader and who ignore the red flags or 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 do not implement systems of accountability. Um, are, you know, they're still there in the case of this institution. And often that's what happens. Um, Mm -hmm. And it takes so it whether or not those structural changes that are needed and those personnel changes that are needed um, will take place. I don't know. So that's I pray pray so because there's a lot, you know, I mean, uh, that there's just so much good that could happen there and has happened there. And just more recently, um, Hills, Hillsong Church in New York City, the lead pastor, Carl Lentz, I think, who um, uh, I have friends who are pastors in New York City said that church is just exploding. And they mm-hmm. said it in a very positive way, like God's doing some amazing things. And I think it's been confirmed he had an affair and um, got fired or let go of his job. And there's been many, many others over the last few years. Uh, some of them are like, well, that's not too shocking. And other ones are like, wow, that really is is kind of coming out of nowhere. It, would you point to what you just said, that there are certain structural things that are enabling these kind of situations from happening? And if we don't change the structures, um, accountability, um, maybe maybe money and fame, whatever, celebrity-driven mm-hmm. culture, are these? Are you saying that in, until we change these structures that we'll probably keep seeing these things from happening? Oh, absolutely. And, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm an English professor. I read books. I'm not, you know, an institutional leader. So, but it's not rocket science either, right? I mean, that you can find out on the internet, you can find 800 to 1000 word think pieces on how to, you know, build in some accountabilities that are very basic and no brainers for any institution. Um, and so, you know, so that there are lots of things that can be done if you want them done. Mm-hmm. And then I think there's th- so there I think there are structural institutional safeguards, but then there are also the human realities that we have to recognize the th- things like loyalty and nepotism and hmm. and um, just, you know, relational power. These are things we're all um subject to and vulnerable to. And so we need to be aware of that. Um, I mean, you can have I mean, some of the, some abuses that go on and, and cover ups that go along with them aren't even tied to the an institution. They're just in, tied to uh, friendship or relationship that is, you know, is uh, something that's you know, has some sort of pragmatic value or even just, you know, a personal value. Mm-hmm. And so we have to have a growing awareness of how easily we can become complicit in something just because we have a loyalty or a friendship or something of our own that might be at risk if we, you know, tread um, too heavily on someone else. Um, yeah. So there are the sort of, you know, institutional structural things, but there are also the human things that we just, mm-hmm. we need to become aware of. And I think that that's, I actually think in this age that we're in that we've been talking about so pessimistically i actually think this is a good thing that's emerging um i i I get i think that there to talk about 500 year moments again i mean i think that we are coming we are seeing recognizing the kinds of institutional abuses and cover-ups that have been taking place in a way that's similar to that recognition from you know 500 years ago yeah wow yeah i mean certainly it's social media and our iPhone culture and everything, it, it does make it harder to get by with stuff, right? It was, <laughs> um, <laughs> or yeah, it gives you another avenue to air out your yourself. stupidity <laughs> and other people to see it, you know, um, chasing down tweets from 12 years ago or whatever. And it's like, um, well, Karen, I've kept you, kept you over an hour. Thank you so much for your time. Always a delight to talk to you. I just, I love, love, love hearing your perspective about just kind of everything, really. So <laughs> uh, thanks for what you do. Thanks for being bold and courageous. And I uh, wish you the best over there at Southeastern. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Preston. Good to talk to you. You too.